Hi guys, Kellen and I spend all of our time trying to figure out how to navigate complicated cannabis challenges. Today, we are excited to bring to you a solution for your accounting needs. Navigating 280E, keeping clean books, and providing financial and accounting advice is a massive headache for so many businesses. End to End is a team of CPAs with backgrounds from the big public firms that specialize in the cannabis industry. End to End is offering a no-cost consultation if you tell them the dime sent you. That's right, free accounting advice. Go to n2nadvisors.com now to take advantage of this. That's n, the number 2, n, a, d, v, i, s, o, r, s.com to get free accounting advice now. Let's talk about Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. That's right. No more excuses. Get your lazy ass off the couch. Go start a podcast. There's the creation tool that allows you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Once again, no more excuses. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. Could it be easier? Even better, you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. That's right. They're paying us for this ad. Thank you very much, Anchor. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started now. This is The Dime, a 10-minute dive into the cannabis and hemp industry through trends, insights, predictions, and tangents. What's up, guys? This is the week of October 15th. This is The Dime. This week, we're talking about green cannabis. As the global cannabis industry continues to expand, more and more commercial cannabis will be grown. That being said, as independent farmers have advised their own theories about how to make cannabis farming and productions more sustainable. Kellen, do you know of any methods farmers use to try and make more environmental friendly cannabis production? I do. Oh, you, do you want me to elaborate? It wasn't a yes or no question. <laughs> no idea. So um, it's actually a really interesting scenario that's playing out in these different states, right? The Emerald Triangle, right? I did some work up there. That is very crunchy, I guess you could say. Very, very hippie, kind of get back to the land. So they all cultivate with what's called teas, right? So they brew an organic tea. They grow outside. So there's no electricity they're using. They're using the sun. They're not using any of the salts, which are your traditional big ag way of getting nutrients into your plants is they salt they just have salts they put the salts in the water and then they feed the plant through that so there is a huge push to cultivate outside in in Humboldt it's cheaper you're able to get massive amounts of material um, the old company I work for did this exact same cultivation method they still are up in Washington as well um, it's really green it's pesticide free uh, the, the brews are all, the teas are all natural, right? So that's literally compost and the best way to cultivate. So I think that cannabis is probably on the cutting edge of green agriculture because it's such a high value commodity that they're, they have the luxury of large margins, which equal large profits that then they can spend more money on infrastructure and do things significantly different than you would when you're doing high volume, low margin kind of agriculture. Say you're growing grass seed or something like that, like every penny counts versus cannabis. It's a completely different thing, at least in California and, and Washington and these kind of states that have a more robust traditional outdoor agricultural community. Colorado, completely different story, right? Like it gets really cold and it snows a lot in Colorado. Colorado is all indoor and you see people growing not in soil, but in rock wool. They salt all of their plants. So they're putting all these salts into the feed systems and all these gnarly things. But at the end of the day, this is what's really terrible about the whole entire situation is that growing sustainably in the cannabis market is being pushed out because the top shelf and the top quality products are grown inside because you can control all variables, but they're using way gnarly chemical, way more gnarly chemicals. It's way worse for the water table, but it produces a better looking flower that sells better, that you get a better price for. 
So when you go to a dispensary to move your product from a wholesale perspective, you will get a lower price if you grew the material outside. Even if it looks better than some indoor material, it doesn't matter. Consumers are now trained to only, if you want top shelf material, it had to be grown indoors. It's going to be really interesting to see how that like consumerism hopefully catches up with the rest of the world in terms of like feel good decision-making. I mean, that's probably something you would never consider, Brian, right? It's like you go into the dispensary and you're like, I wonder which cannabis was grown sustainably. I want that one, right? Like that's probably not the decision-making process that approaches your mind, at least when you go into dispensary. I mean, tell me I'm wrong. No, you're, you're <laughs> spot on. I can't imagine that's ever been a thought uh, that I had. It was like, well, I hope they don't use chemicals that could potentially kill me on here. I just take that for granted, just like I would do with I know your favorite um, vegetable tomatoes, right? Or fruit, some people would describe that as. I, I know from what you described to me, that process is horrible. And sorry, Otis is involving himself in this topic. <laughs> and when consumers do go into a dispensary, they're only looking, in, in my opinion, for a few characteristics. How does it smell? Which wonder if that still happens with COVID. Can you still smell the product? I have not been in a dispensary since we started this. Can you still get so smelling the product is state by state. Washington, you're not allowed to smell it at all. It's in a jar. You can look at it through the jar. That's it. Colorado is probably the most traditional experience that you could have from like the old school going to your drug dealer's house and like opening the bag and looking at it and smelling it and all that stuff, right? Colorado, that is how it works, right? So they have a big jar. They'll open it. And now instead of like me being able to like jam my face in there, they'll like waft it to you, right? So they like move their hand over the top. <laughs> it's a pretty good like workaround, I guess, right? But Colorado's always been like that. California, no. Washington, no. Oregon, I've never, I haven't been to a dispensary in Oregon. I don't you think. can you can smell them in the dispensary. Or let me, let me refrain. You used to be able to smell them. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. So then Oregon was like Colorado. Yeah, and, and that to me was like a, was a big influence on how to select a strain, I think. When you go walk up to a dispensary and there's 96 different strains of cannabis, making a selection is terribly overwhelming. There's ridiculous names. All of them are interesting and kind of unique. They've got different cannabinoid content. And the only other way to differentiate is, is what they smell like. Sure, you can ask the bud tender, you know, what, what type of high you should anticipate or how you'll feel or the taste. But at the end of the day, I, I think that the sustainability act, well, it's great in nature. I don't think any consumers really care about that unless it drives up the, yeah. the bottom line. If it's organic and the prices are double, I can imagine only select individuals are really gonna give a shit enough to spend the extra $10 a gram because this was grown in a beautiful environment that allowed the plant to prosper as it seemed fit. Next question, Kellen. How? How's climate change, whether you believe in climate change or not, hopefully you do, has affected the cannabis industry. How has climate change affected the cannabis industry? If I you mean, are a climate change believer or not climate change believer. Whatever you want to believe, you believe you. You know, you just do you is not the way I look at it. Um, I'll do me. Um, but that whole science background kind of makes me favor one side. I won't say it, but. <laughs> is, it, is it the science side or the non-science side? Weird. I, I actually support the science, which is <laughs> it's strange, surprising. Right? <laughs> but uh, I mean, this is a perfect year uh, in terms of if you're looking to draw a direct conclusion of the effect of climate change on an agricultural product. Um, it's been this case, been this way for the last four years. I've personally known a lot of people that lost everything in the Paradise uh, Paradise Fire last year, where the whole town was decimated. Um, I know people that lost their entire farm, everything um, from that fire. A lot of grows out there were just completely demolished. Um, a lot of cultivation happens in Northern California where all of these forest fires are prevalent. The Santa Rosa area is a massive hotspot for cultivation. I know a ton of farmers that lost their entire crop there as well. Um, and it's just kind of pre prevalent the whole way up the 101 corridor. Um, you're going to see just kind of tragic story after tragic story of individuals that were had their own land growing, living off the land, making money by being able to sell a 
uh, agricultural commodity legally now, and the fires just completely decimated all of their crops and their land. And now they're just sitting there like, what do we do next? You know? And so, I mean, these fire, the fires just keep getting worse in California and um, calm whatever you want, drought or whatever. But like, personally, I think that there can be a direct correlation to climate change and how that has made the wildfires a lot worse over the last five to 10 years in California. And I think that's probably just like one of the easiest kind of opening closed cases to support that shows the effect of climate change on cannabis, at least, you know? Um, I mean, can you think of any other examples, Brian? I mean, is that something that you would directly tie to uh, climate change is the ridiculous amounts of wildfires that California is seeing? Yeah, and I wonder if force management will make a difference, but we'll see kind of how that works out. Um, it's, it's sad, right? People who have their entire investments into these facilities and these outdoor grows, and they live season to season based on how much they produce and how much they sell. It's, it's really unfortunate that they could potentially lose everything. And from an insurance standpoint, I, I still wonder how much coverage they're able to get with the product being federally illegal. I know with hemp, we talked about that for a while, of the importance of crop insurance. And before maybe six, seven months ago, it didn't exist. It literally didn't exist. People would grow this crop and they'd be shed of luck. And that's a really hard way to legitimize and stabilize an industry that is employing many people that that helps the economy and that allows others to kind of live their life off of and until we can check that box of making sure that people who are in this legal space are able to have legitimate protection issues such as issues like this it's, it's going to be a big problem for the, the people out in california prediction time will cannabis companies make a large effort to stabilize their products from a sustainability standpoint? Um, yes, I think that they already are, right? I think that you see this like kind of battle line drawn in terms of the outdoor organic kind of situation. Um, I think that's kind of maybe the next phase of consumerism within the cannabis market is then moving into like the organic and that kind of thought process. But I mean, just if we like literally look at the cannabis industry versus any other industry from like a bird's eye perspective, it's the only industry that requires pesticide analysis for a agricultural product that is consumed, right? Like that's pretty shocking, right? Like if we think about cannabis is not allowed to have a pesticide called mycobutanol on it because when you heat it up, it turns to cyanide and people smoke cannabis, but <clears throat> all tomatoes, on the planet are grown with Michael Butanol. Have you ever smoked a shed, tomato? People make this thing called spaghetti sauce oh. that you have to heat tomatoes up for. So like, I don't know, call me a hypocrite, but like, it seems like if you're gonna use that on cannabis and heat it up and inhale it, but then you're gonna use it on tomatoes and then heat the tomatoes up in a pan and smell it over, like, you know what I mean? So um, they will make, I think it's coming, but I think that it's, probably 10 years out, right? Like the industry is so new. People get so excited when they walk into a dispensary for the first time. Like you're going to hear for the next five years, years, stories of people that are like, oh, I went to a dispensary for the first time, right? Like they're not anywhere close to the thought process of, oh, I went to this market and I'm buying an organic product, right? Like they're just excited to be able to view cannabis products in general, right? So I do think it's a long ways out, but I, I, I see it getting there, right? Like it's happened in all these other agricultural spaces. Um, I mean, do, do you, like, I know this is a tangent, but like, do you buy organic produce, right? Mm -hmm. you go to the store? I'm not the decision maker uh, of that <laughs> selection. So I, I would defer that, that situation to my supervisor. Does the supervisor pur purchase organic produce? Maybe I would have to ask. Um, all right, all right. Well, we'll figure that out next week. I'm going to bring that back up. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> so I've got a different take on this, right? And I read an article in Forbes that discussed how in cannabis, there is no McDonald's brand. And that is a hard concept for people in the industry. When I say people in the industry, I mean 
consumers interested in consuming cannabis to kind of wrap their head around that there's not a product that they can lean on, that they can trust, that every time that they go to McDonald's, if they get a cheeseburger, it's going to taste like a cheeseburger. It's an agricultural product. And what I have read was that it's considered close enough. So if they produce a strain that's within certain cannabinoids and certain terpenes, the hope is that they will be able to stabilize the genetics across the growing phase so that they can produce a product that is close enough. But the additional factors of the endocannabinoid system are going to influence how each individual receives the cannabinoids and then it influences how they feel. And, and because of that, there's a long way to go between stabilizing the anticipated feeling of consuming a product and actually how it works. So the long story answer is you're not, you're not eating a tomato and feeling a certain way, right? When you eat a tomato, you don't feel good. When you eat spinach, you don't feel good. When you smoke cannabis, you're hoping for a specific type of high. That's my assumption. And I don't think we're ever going to get to a consistent portion personally that you can consume a product and feel this, the same way every single time. You might be in the ballpark, which should be considered close enough. But I think until those expectations and realities get closer, we're going to have a lot of, well, I tried this product in Massachusetts. It stunk. Why would I try it in Florida? And that I think is, is still a long ways away from being where we should be. And, and I think that just shows the beauty of the industry is we're so far in the, the infancy stage that we've got an enormous amount of runway to continue on from growth. I agree. And that's a really good point, Brad. Thank you. You're welcome. Cool. Thanks everyone for listening. <laughs> I'm Larry Michigan. I'd like to invite you to join Jim Marty and me on our weekly podcast, The Deadhead Cannabis Show. Each week we explore the latest cannabis and jam band news and reminisce with other cannabis industry deadheads and jam band aficionados about the great musical acts that we've seen and heard. Check out a new episode every Monday at mjbulls.com or wherever you listen to podcasts.